iHeartRadio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz. Shall I go first? Since yes, it's please. Five years yeah, ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, my agent called me up and said, um, do you want to audition for this thing called Back to the Future the Musical, which at that point was a workshop like read-through thing in London. And I was like, I'm not doing anything else today. Sure, why not? Um, went in and, and booked it. And uh, we did the first read-through with uh, what would turn out to be the original Manchester London cast. Um, and it was incredible. I'd never done a musical in my life before, ever. Um, and I was surrounded by these people who could sing the roof off and the, what I was hearing about what they were going to do with the car. And Anna Silvestri was there. And then Robert Zemeckis started turning up. And I was like, cool, I've got to hang on to this thing for dear life um, because this is going places. And uh, they didn't manage to shake me off from Manchester. And then we got shut down for COVID. And they didn't manage to shake me off from the uh, London West End um, version where we won the Olivier Award for Best New Musical, which was great. Um, and they still didn't manage to shake me off when they came to America. So now I'm here and I can't believe it. I can believe it. He's great. <laughs> He's great. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, uh, I was doing a show called Almost Famous on Broadway. And then they asked me to come in for the show um, and I wasn't available, which is uh, much like Michael J. Fox's story with the movie. He wasn't available because he was doing another show at the time. Um, and then my show closed prematurely and it gave me enough time to uh, prepare uh, for Back to the Future. And so then I, once I figured all that out, once I did the math of my calendar, I, I, I was like, just like so thrilled that I was able to audition. And then once I auditioned, I guess I did it well enough. <laughs> and then they gave it to me. Um, but I, yeah, it's a privilege every day. Getting to play George McFly is great. I mean, I read this from watching him the first time in the movie. I was like, oh, cool. So it's me when I was at school. I was terrified of everybody, terrified of girls, didn't have to talk to anybody. I was like, well, this would be easy. I'll just act myself. Um, and the fact that I'm not the best dancer in the world, not the best singer in the world, that kind of adds to it. Um, and I think over the years, people have been like, it's a stage door, a stage door. People are like, um, it's so incredible how you're such a good dancer and yet you dance so badly. And I'm like, where have you got me being good? You've not seen me dance well and then dance badly. I just dance badly and they go, well, he's on Broadway, he must be a good dancer. And I'm not. It's, it's a not scam. True. It's not true. Um, but yes, no, it's great. It's, it, it, it's unbelievable to get to play George McFly and then come across and dance and sing with him, uh, voice of an angel, uh, and he can act as well, he can do it all, which is really annoying, and he's young, God's sake. Thanks, man. <laughs> That's really nice. Um, yeah, no, it's great, I've got an absolute whale of a time, and it's great to do with you every night. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I'm, uh, I've just been doing it for a minute, and then, and I, I guess I started acting when I was three, and then, and then uh, to prepare for this role, um, just like, it, it was like bringing out all the things that I've done since I was three years old. It was like the renaissance man of my life. It was like, I did Taekwondo for a little bit, so there's a few fight, fight sequences that I do. <laughs> and, then, and then what else? I, uh, guitar, I've learned guitar. I've known guitar since I was eight years old. So uh, just bringing out old skills was, was a lot of um, the challenge. And then Skateboarding? Uh, skateboarding, yeah, I used to skateboard the when I was The streets of Arizona. Yes, yes, oh, they've been, they've been ridden. <laughs> <laughs> they've, been, they've, been, they've been skated. It's skated. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the word Grinded, <laughs> even. Um, yeah, uh, but then uh, most of my, pr uh, my preparedness was coming from um, just training in the gym because it's just a huge physical ask of a show and uh, vocal ask as well. Um, and then I didn't do any preparation for the... the mar we both talked about that. We didn't do any preparation for the voices of the Michael J. No. Fox and Crispin Glover. Mm -mm. I just did it. It just sort of happened. Like yeah. for me, it just came. Like I was in. Uh, we we just done the first like workshop reading the first day, and I did it, and it seemed to go all right. And uh, uh, I ended up at the bus stop outside a theatre that I was supposed to be doing. Only Fools and Horses, the musical, which was now on the West End, and I couldn't do that because of other things. And I was next to this thing. I was like, oh. and then I just started doing the voice, and it just went went in. It just clipped, you know. And yeah. that I can take you to that exact bus stop where I where I did it. Yeah. But yeah, we didn't like practice it yeah i have a very similar story i mean we have practiced the roles we do we have rehearsed i <laughs> promise it is worth the ticket price <laughs> big fan of the movie growing up huge fan my m mom always compared me to michael j fox and um and i just think it's a perfect film i love anything spielberg touches and and because spielberg touched it then uh bob zemeckis touched it and uh 
Well, actually, the other way around. But I mean, Bob Zemeckis is also brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'd never seen it. Wow. A- until the night before the audition, and I was <laughs> like, better give it a cursory glance, see what I'm doing. How on earth am I going to do that? Um, but then I watched it, and through the rehearsal process, and obviously I've watched it again and again and again, you're right, it's the perfect film. And getting to t- chat to Bob Gale, the writer, about um, how he made it, and just like stories from the set, and I'm so into it now, to like a granular detail, it's the best film ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, our friend Hugh has not met... Crispin Glover. I feel like you better be watching this, Crispin. It's been five years, five whole years. I've been messaging you, I've been doing this show every night. Like ticket at the box office. Is he? Is he turned up? Is he turned up tonight? No. He's I feel like the da- the boy whose dad won't come and watch him in the school play. Oh. I've had it. I'm calling you out, Crispin. Come and watch the come and watch the musical. Um, no, it's great watching everyone else meet the person that they've been obsessed with for five years and not um, get to chat to Crispin about it. But no, it's fine. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a great experience. <laughs> <laughs> I met Michael J. Fox, and I was. It was uh, five minutes before call time for our gala night performance and it was just me and Roger Bart who plays Doc walking through Times Square in our costumes to meet the Doc and Marty from the movie in front of the theater and then we go there and then um, we, we took pictures and, and, and by the time Michael left I had said um, I, need, I, I need some advice what do, what do you have for me anything anything at all Michael and he said kick ass and if you put your mind to it you can accomplish anything so that's what he said and uh and i tried my best to do that and yeah it was great that'd be great a letter even a letter a letter from chris like some some black pebbles in an envelope <laughs> just anything i think that's more your style just any contact what's let me know you're out there buy vintage clothes buy secondhand clothes because if we buy i'm gonna go on my high horse now if we buy sort of like new clothes everyone else is gonna have them you are a unique individual and you can buy secondhand clothes from people in your city who love what they do it's art you know this is a uh, pendleton cardigan from the 1970s i think this is um from the east village go and find these tiny little vintage shops because every single item is unique and uh, you'll make their their day and putting my clothes on in the morning makes me excited to tackle the day and have a wardrobe that's as unique as you are because i know you're unique you're great and beautiful uh, great advice right. i have such not as good <laughs> advice but m- my advice is as someone who didn't grow up with a whole ton of money you can look really rich and not actually be rich if you just figure out color coordination <laughs> and tone coordination for example this is a white shirt but i have b- dark black pants on, uh, which is what you uh, should probably do, because if it was too light, then you're going to get washed out, because I'm white, and very, very white at that. So, just stuff like that, and you can all do, you can do all that with vintage. Go to Goodwill. Like, the, like the, the incredible stuff you can find in Goodwill for less than $10, and just because something's got, like, a big logo on it, it's like Versace, Chanel, it's boring, it's so boring. Uh, Everybody has that. If you've got enough money, you can buy that. But n- no one's going to find your Powder Puff Girls t-shirt that you found in Goodwill for five bucks and you wear. It's incredible. You Sorry. can also, while you're at Goodwill, find a plate with a half-eaten raisin on it. Um, that's called a prize. That's called a, That's the prize for going <laughs> to shop vintage. I don't know. Maybe Arizona Goodwills aren't like everywhere else, but that's... I bet the Arizona Goodwills are like in Peng, like there's, um, well I used to run a vintage shop and we used to find the incredible stuff you'd find in pockets, you'd find watches, you'd find ticket stubs, you'd find sometimes a half eaten sandwich, you never know. But again, prizes. Another question for me, Um, (laughs) I'll I'll fill this one. Uh, I love the NFL. Um, I'm the biggest NFL nerd. So the vintage shop that I mentioned, I used to sell NFL jerseys. And so I can, um, if a jersey walks towards me, from the beginning of the NFL when they started manufacturing jerseys in the 1980s. From the number on the front and the team, I can tell you who's on the back. So for the Jets to come, um, I thought that everyone in America was like, everyone knows who the NFL players are. Everyone knows who Aaron Rodgers is, for example. And then underneath the flat, I was like, the special person in tonight, Aaron Rodgers, New York Jets. I was like, and I was walking around being like, Aaron Rodgers is in, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers is in. And people were like, yeah. I said, what do you mean? It's Aaron Rodgers. 
what? What are you talking about? And so he came to the show with Tim Boyle, CJ Zoma, Solomon Thomas. Um, and I always thought, you know, that NFL players were just sort of like big, like jock dudes. They love a bit of theater. They've been to MJ, they've been to Moulin Rouge, um, and they couldn't have been nicer. And they continue to like, it just blows my mind the sort of professional respect they have for us. I watched a video yesterday of Solomon Thomas being like, you know, um, uh, Kobe Bryant used to talk to actors about how they get in the zone before a performance. And like, it's really interesting to me because we do the same thing. And I was like, yes, you're right. I am an NFL player. That's correct. We are the same. Um, no, it was just an, it was an incredible experience. And now we just need the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to come to New York, please. Yeah, yeah. That that was perfectly worth it. They're <laughs> they're very. I always compare acting to uh, sports, which is seems like opposite ends of, the, ends of the spectrum. But they're actually the only like two jobs I can think of that are so so similar in in practice. And it was just very cool to talk to them. Um, and they were very nice to us when we went to that game. Yeah. What's really cool about the Jets supporting us is that when I'm at the stage door, it brings like normal people to the theater, which is really great. Like I still to this day that the, the episode that they aired of Hard Knocks was months ago and there's still people who are like, we came from Hard Knocks, which is amazing. And uh, little boys who are, f who are wearing sports jerseys are watching theater. And like, like just coming to theater for the first time and seeing you and being like, that I can see myself in this. This is yeah. musical. This is for me. I, this is cool. You know. They, they could have. <laughs> we brought sports kids to the theater, and they could have made so much money in sports. But now their dream is to be in theater, and then they'll be broke. <laughs> so I think that's what dreams are made of, if you ask me. <laughs> so I'm on stage, looking. We've just me and Nate have just come on. Uh, what, let me know what point you realize what story I'm telling. Um, uh, I'm looking up stage and Nate uh, delivers his first line. And when you're on stage, you can hear when a line hasn't been picked up by a mic. You're just like, oh, okay, cool. I guess we've missed a cue there or something. And I turn around and Nate hasn't got the microphone on his head. And I was like, what? Um, I, I, honestly, my head was like, how are we gonna get through this scene? But we did, because um, I saw it dawn on Nate's face. He just went from the Winter Garden to the RSC and just started projecting for all he was with, just screaming the lines out. So I think it was fine, um, but it was very much me on mic and then Nate just like in the opera house, just like screaming it out. We got through the scene, he was shaving and got it caught underneath his- McFly! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, McFly! And I was like, he has? Um, and uh, yeah, we got through the scene, and, but he got it caught underneath his um, top when he was shaving and then forgot to put it back on. Great. Yeah. So great. Uh, probably my favorite. There's a couple favorites I have, but the one I'll tell is um, there was a moment when um, Doc's lab comes in um, from both sides of the stage in, in, in two different pieces, two different halves. And one night, one of those halves didn't come out. And unfortunately, there are props. We could have ignored it, but we knew the scene was heading to a place where we needed to access a prop that was on the other half of the set. So unfortunately, we walked into the scene and we just had to acknowledge it because we knew the scene was not gonna continue without it. And we just, I just walked in, I go, Doc, Doc, what, I, I, I can't believe you here. And then we both looked at me and I went, where's your house, man? <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, oh, they're still moving it in. It's, it's still taking a while. And then finally it comes on. And then he goes, oh, the movers, they're great. They're so fast. And then we're just watching it. He's like, this way, this way. Um, and it's, getting, it's being wheeled in. And then finally it lands. And then we just look at each other. We go, from the top? And he goes, yeah, from the top. So I go, from the, I go back out of the lab and then we come back and we do this scene again. Um, so I love that one. And the audience goes wild. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's great. I mean, it's like it's obviously it shakes you up a bit, but it's like so great because the audience uh, gets to see how well you deal with. But that's stuff. the thing when when something like that happens in live theatre because the film the the musical is such a interesting blend of movie musical. You can honestly forget it's live theatre, especially on Broadway when things are so polished and so the lights. And when something like that happens, you feel the audience go. Oh, because you, they're reminded instantly that it's actually live and these people are in the room with you and anything can happen. Yeah. And so like, it's, it's great when those, and that's why you do theater really, because these yeah. things are gonna happen, right? You know, <laughs> all my youngins who are at least a year younger than me, uh, I, 
I the only thing I ever say is just to always keep working. I mean, I'm still in voice lessons, and um, I I still have a lot of things I can work on as a performer. And I think the second you get stagnant, you let um, ego get in the way, and then other people are also working and 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 they're doing the voice lessons. So just uh, never get stuck. Um, always keep going. <coughs> I would say um, if you're like, this is like me when I was 16 through <coughs> 18, I think. I was so obsessed with, oh, I need to get an agent. I need to get, a, get in front of that director. I need to get that audition. I need to get in that. Sh Forget that. It's not, it's not important. You know, just make great theatre with your mates. Because I was fortunate enough to be able to do that when I was at university. We made, we did Two Gentlemen of Verona, a Shakespeare play in a warehouse, which is with my friends. And that is the most important thing because all the other stuff will come because of your love for theatre and you're only going to foster your love for theatre and grow and make mistakes, awful, terrible mistakes with your mates doing theatre that you love. So focus on that, please. And then the agents will come and all that you know, sort of stuff. Because by the time you're working on Broadway and you're paying tax and you're like wondering if the phone's going to ring, you're going to want to be just making theatre with your mates. So focus on that. I Heart Radio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz.